We are now in the month of February. The month of love. Oh, leap year, yes. Well, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to kind of figure out where people are with regards to like Valentine's Day and all that good stuff. And unfortunately today, if you are not a fan of it, I'm gonna be telling you about a love story. But I want you to go with me on this journey to imagine a love story that really goes beyond the ordinary. One where passion and pain meet and where faithfulness triumphs over betrayal. Sounds kind of like a telenovela or maybe a, a soap opera if you used to watch your stories. But this actually comes to us from scripture. And I think I shared with you a few weeks ago that you know, if people tell you the Bible is boring, I think they're reading the wrong parts. And we're going to delve into one of the most kind of unusual and challenging stories in Scripture that comes to us from the Old Testament. It comes to us from the pages of Hosea. And we're going to actually dig into the first three chapters today. I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the story and how it really unveils the heart of God through the life of this prophet, Hosea. And Hosea, yes, is in the Old Testament. He's a prophet. And this is a powerful and symbolic story for us. And so as we continue in this journey to explore the character of God, you know, in the sermon series, God Unfiltered, um, we've used this guidepost that comes to us from Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7, where God actually describes his character. And he gives us these key words, that he is compassionate, that he is gracious, that he is slow to anger, that he is abounding in love, which is what we're going to dig into today, and that he is faithful. And so digging through these, we also want to look to the whole of Scripture, because we just don't read one little bit. We read the whole of Scripture. Is that actually there's powerful pieces like we find in Hosea that illustrates these characteristics of God. And so let's talk a little bit about Hosea. He is a prophet. He is called by God to a very unusual task. He is called to marry a woman named Gomer. I know, they should have reverse names, I know. But Gomer is the wife, Hosea is the husband. Um, and Gomer, not only is she a um, scandalous woman, she sort of in this story represents God's relationship with Israel. And their marriage really becomes a metaphor for this troubled relationship between God and the people of Israel. So God is really asking Hosea, I want you to not only preach this, but live it. And so in their marriage, Gomer bears Hosea three children, and they are each given a symbolic name. Now, if you haven't figured this out, a lot of names in Scripture are symbolic or represent that person's character or something that is being trying to be conveyed. So the first child is Jezreel, that signifies God's judgment on the house of Jeru for their past sin. So this kid right off the bat is like, you know, my name isn't really a positive thing. Well, then there's a second child, Lo Rahamai, who means not pitied. And it represents like God's withdrawal of his mercy because of Israel's persistent disobedience. I know, this is a horrible love story. And then you get to the final child, number three. Oh, number three is always fun, aren't they? Um, lo amini, meaning not my people, that God is done with Israel. Like, I am so done with you people. Like, you are trying my patience, and I got nothing left. I am done. And so, you know, this is kind of God saying, I, I really want you guys to get this. I'm done being taken advantage of, of you, you know, being, having you take advantage of me. Now, despite these names, you know, despite what these names even represent, Hosea's commitment to Gomer parallels God's enduring love for Israel. That Gomer, actually, she will be unfaithful to Hosea. And, you know, that's usually the deal breaker for a lot of us in relationships, isn't it? When someone betrays us or in a marriage, if somebody is unfaithful, we're like, oh, I can't, I cannot forgive that. That is the unpardonable sin in marriage, isn't it? And yet Hosea is faithful. And Gomer, you know, is this kind of unfaithful wife, is really mirroring what Israel has been doing to God continually. They have chased after other gods. They have broken the promise that they have made with God, that they've covenanted 
with God, to be his people, and to have no other gods before him. And they have also been very ungrateful, like just disrespectful to God. And so God's like, you know what? If you really want to do this, I'm going to leave you to your own devices. And so this is a, a metaphor, but it's also Hosea's real life of, you know, representing God turning away from this situation. And, and God talked about this a little bit last week, you know, about God's anger and how often what we interpret as punishment is really simply natural consequences that God will allow us to have really what we're demanding. You know, you want to go your own way? Go. See what life is like without me. And he will, God will allow us to experience those consequences for us. He won't always rescue us from some of the things that happen because of our poor choices. Because that, in that, we kind of get to experience what life is like apart from God. Now, this story does take a shift. It has a turn to it. And trust me, it's still a love story. That, yes, God is going to express judgment, but he's also going to express mercy. Because despite Israel's unfaithfulness, God at this point promises to woo her back. And he invites Hosea to do the same. Woo your wife back. Take her to the wilderness. This symbol of where God's love story began with the people of Israel. So this is a chance for them to kind of renew their relationship. To um, take time for a little bit of restoration. And I love the idea that they go back to where it began. Reminding each other of their first love. And the language becomes very poetic. You know, it's a love story. You've got to have some poetry in there. But God and Hosea desire for this relationship to work out, for this covenant to do its job and cement these people together. And this is a powerful image of what it is to be pursued by God, even in the face of betrayal, even in the face when we have done nothing to warrant God pursuing us again. And I want to read to you these, these lines that come to us from Hosea chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, because it illustrates not only Hosea's heart for Gomer, but also God's heart for Israel. Because again, this metaphor is really about representing that relationship that God has with Israel. I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice, in devoted love and in mercy. This isn't just like you know, I made a promise, I'm going to keep it. No, I'm going to actually not only stay, but I'm going to renew my love with you. I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. And so these are Hosea's words, but they are also God giving Hosea these words to demonstrate God's divine love. That, you know, as Hosea goes and pursues this unfaithful wife, Gomer, from really where she's landed, you know, she has left the marriage. She has, you know, kind of abandoned what they had. And Hosea goes after her. He goes after her, much like God comes after Israel time and time again to restore their relationship, even in spite of their waywardness, even in spite of them leaving. God goes after them to bring them home. And this act of kind of redemption illustrates God's unwavering commitment to his people. And it emphasizes the possibility that is always there. There is always hope. There is always possibility of reconciliation through repentance. And we've talked about this before, that repentance is really turning back to God. It is just shifting your focus back to God. And so in this rocky relationship that we read about in Hosea, that we see Hosea and his unfaithful wife, Gomer, that this powerful metaphor for this very complex and strained relationship between God and Israel always has an element of hope in it. That while the names of the children are kind of heartbreaking, it conveys the consequences of actions. And at the same time, God's enduring love, God's reckless love, as we sang just a few moments ago, that God's desire for restoration and reconciliation is more powerful than our poor choices. That God's unwavering love exists and his desire for redemption for us comes in spite of our human frailty. And so as we think about what this means for us, like what does this love that is depicted in Hosea, this loyal love, this abounding love, as we've kind of pulled from Exodus a little bit, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. It is in some ways uncomprehensible. 
You know, we don't experience this, this undeserved extravagant love from other people. And I think a lot of us have been written off by folks. We've been maybe not abandoned, but discarded in a lot of ways. And it may not be that you know, kind of formal, but it feels like we've been ignored. We've been avoided. But in the purposes of God, in God's desire for relationship with us, he will continually seek us out, continually be watching for us, ready to welcome us home. See, Hosea's life was a message to God's people and the ways that God would show his love to his people. It is a big love, a divine love. And the funny thing is that this big love, particularly in these passages, is actually a very tiny word. It's a, it's a word that we do translate as love from the Hebrew. Again, remember our Old Testament is primarily written in Hebrew and we translate it into English. And it, this love that we translate is a huge theme throughout not only Hosea, but throughout scripture itself. You know, we, like I said, we, we describe it as abounding love or loyal love in Exodus 34, verse 6. And the word in Hebrew is hesed. Hesed, it's a little word, but it has a lot of meaning to it. And it's one of the most significant words in the Hebrew Bible. It speaks both to the reality of God's character and God's desire for our character, meaning God wants that for ourselves, that we would experience it and pour it out and demonstrate it. Now, it, yes, it's translated as love, steadfast love, loving kindness. So, it, you know, this persevering love, a tender affection, an ongoing care for others. But it's also sometimes translated as mercy to convey to us undeserved kindness or passing over you know, to put aside a deserved judgment is to have mercy, is to say, you know what, yeah, you deserve this, but I'm going to wipe the slate clean. And sometimes it's described as covenant faithfulness, that this loyalty of one partner to another in promises that are made. I'm going to stick it out. And it speaks of fulfilling the promises not only in, in kind of thought and word, but also in action. Like, I'm going to follow through. This is where, you know, your words and your life fall together that your talk and your walk are in alignment. And hesed is the sort of thing that we see. You know, hesed, we get glimpses of it in, in real life. We see it in the best of friendships, people who are just loyal to one another. We see it in, in some of the most enduring marriages that have just stood the test of time. We see it sometimes even in soldiers who have stuck it out, stuck through really hard times together. And, you know, think about it, you know, in a lot of ways that, when we translate, you know, it's not often, you know, this word for that word. It's not a direct correlation. There's often some richness and nuance, and hesed is one of those. So that's why I want us to kind of understand the fullness of this word, because it has three concepts to it. Love, generosity, and enduring commitment. Love, generosity, and enduring commitment. We're told that God's hesed is so great that he will not forsake his people and will faithfully love them forever. No matter what you do, you cannot get rid of God's love. No matter what you do, you cannot get rid of God's love. And he is loyal to you to the very end. It doesn't mean he's going to put up with a lot of your behaviors and things, but his love isn't going anywhere. And they are based in these promises that God has made, that even throughout all of Scripture, that he first made with Abraham, and then Moses, and then David, that even though Israel as a people is faltering and weak, much like we are, we fall short all the time. But God is willing to partner with us regardless. God will remain faithful in all of these circumstances to us. And, you know, a lot of times God is in fact saying, yeah, I know, Israel, you're not going to be able to fulfill this. You're going to fail at times, and I'm going to pick up the slack. I'm going to help carry you at times because that is who I am. He is merciful. He is faithful. He is loving. He is the one who keeps his promises. And that this loyalty is based on this deep care for us. And we see this not only in Scripture, but through you know, not just in Hosea, but throughout Scripture, we see this acted out. 
we see this in the person of Ruth. If you've ever read the Old Testament book of Ruth, we see this young woman who was a foreigner who married an Israelite man, and her husband dies, and so does his brother, and so does his father, and so this family is left with just the two married-in daughters, the daughters-in-law and the mom. And we see Ruth commit herself to the mother Naomi, saying, you know, I'm going to stay by your side. I'm going to take care of you, even though our connection is now kind of broken because my husband is, is gone. I really don't have any relationship with you that others would see, but I am still going to take care of you. I'm going to still stay with you. And it's not based on anything that Naomi can offer her. Naomi herself says, I got no more sons. Are you going to wait till I have another one and he grows up and you marry him? Like, I have nothing to offer you, Ruth. And Ruth says, that's not the point. Because it is based on Ruth's character, not what Naomi has to offer. And I hope that you are catching this in this sermon series. As we talk not only about Ruth's character here, but also seeing how God's character is revealed in these people. That God's character, that character itself, ours, God's, whoever's, God's, our character is not dependent on others or circumstances. We love to blame people for what we do, but in fact, it is always our choice. We are always the one making that choice to live that out based on our character. In particular, when we look at scripture and we see God's character, God's character is not dependent on us. His compassion, his graciousness, his patience, his hesed, his faithfulness is not dependent on our actions or our worthiness. Praise Jesus. It is about his character. God again and again shows his hesed, endures like the story about Jacob, who is a liar, even to his own family. He is just someone you wouldn't trust. But despite that, despite that, God chooses him because this is the family that God is committed to throughout the genealogy. And he's made a promise to Jacob's grandfather, who was Abraham, that he would have a huge family. So God is going to work with Jacob. And God would restore the blessings to all nations through this family. And so 20 years later, Jacob finally gets it. He's looking, I am so undeserving of all that you have given me, God. I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. He's not worthy of it. But God's chesed was never about God, Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise and to his love. And it continues even throughout Jacob's line into where we read about an exodus of Egypt when they are enslaved by Pharaoh that God will hear the people's cry and he will be loyal to them, that God will work through a man named Moses to raise up, not only Moses, but raise up a people to leave their enslavement, to go to the promised land. Again, that wilderness, before they get to the promised land, is where God makes this covenant with them. And this is where Hosea takes his wife, Gomer, to renew their love for one another. And in this story, this action is called an act of hesed because it is about God keeping his word. God is loyal and loving for no other reason, reason that is just who God is. Now, of course, he wants his people to respond with hesed in return. You know, that is God's hope for us. But even when we don't, God's hesed remains. And it is compared, you know, our hesed, our ability to extend this loyal love is sometimes compared to a morning mist. That it's there one moment, it's gone the next. You know, the fog in the morning, it's there, but by noon it is gone. That is sometimes what our hesed looks like. But God's hesed, God's hesed will be described in Psalm 136 as enduring. And that we should give thanks to God for his goodness, for his hesed. And then 26 times, 26 times in this psalm, it repeats, his hesed is forever. His hesed is forever. His hesed is forever. I'm not going to say that 26 times, but I just said it three times, and you're like, whoa, that's a lot. It keeps going on, and it goes on for centuries in Israel, continually, again, falling short, failing, finding other gods to worship, committing horrible injustices, chasing after power and wealth in ways that they shouldn't, and this history of violence and death. And God continues to keep his promise in a very dramatic way. He keeps his promise by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. God becomes flesh, 
in order to redeem flesh. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth in life said that in him they encountered God, the God of Israel, the God who was loyal and faithful. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. It is him that we see God's hesed lived out in a human life. And in his life, death, and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because this is who God is, generous, loving, eternally loyal to his promises. God shows us what true love is like. So if you are kind of cynical and done with love and all that stuff, I invite you to have God redefine love for you. What does real love look like? What faithfulness looks like shouldn't be taken from others in this life. It should be taken from God. That should be the standard of what love looks like. It begins with him, and it changes, changes Israel, and it changes us. Anyone who encounters God's hesed can't help but be changed. It is startling, it is surprising, and it is amazing and humbling. And so when we encounter the love, the mercy, the faithfulness of God, there is transformation. And God will do whatever he needs to do to capture and recapture us with his love. That when we begin there with that love, that mercy, that faithfulness of God, it should change who we are and how we live. That in experiencing that, we realize there is another way. Encountering God's love, his mercy, and faithfulness, yes, should be transformative. And it's, it's one of the reasons that we here celebrate weekly communion. Because it is an opportunity to experience the grace of God. To be reminded of what God has done for us. That God took on flesh, humbled himself, and that on the night that he sat down to this meal and he broke bread and he offered the cup, that he would then be betrayed. Okay? So in this demonstration of God's incredible faithfulness to us, we see human betrayal, not only in the person of Judas, but also in Peter and the rest of the disciples who just can't have it in them to stand loyally beside Jesus as he is arrested and taken to be tried, convicted, and then the next day, executed. They can't be bothered to stand by him. But in Christ's very sacrifice, he is choosing to stand by us, to make a way for us to come home. See, God's hesed is faithful and more enduring than ours. And God's hesed fills in the gap of ours. And when we come to communion, we remember not only that night, but we have these other words for communion. That one, yes, the Last Supper, which helps us to kind of reorient ourselves to this past event that we celebrate in the present of communion, this meal that Jesus had with his disciples. But we also call it this other word, the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. That actually in the hymnal for our denomination, this practice of communion is called the great thanksgiving. So sit with that as an idea. That when you come to this table is an act of giving thanks for all that God has done to recognize his faithfulness to us his covenant faithfulness, his steadfast love, his loving kindness that knows no end, that endures. So I have something for you to do. I want you to grab a prayer card out of your your bucket if you can, or you may also text this in. But I want you to make this a physical act because so often we, we tend to think about, okay, this is what the pastor asked us to do, la, 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 whatever, I'll do it later. Okay, as soon as you hit that parking lot, you're gonna forget what I asked you to do. I know. I know, I forget everything when I walk out that door. I mean, it is a blank slate, and all I'm thinking about is my Sunday afternoon nap. But I want you to sit for a moment. You can do this while we are coming to communion. You can do this right now. But I want you to write down on that card or to text it in. What is something that you are grateful to God for? Maybe it was an unexpected kindness from somebody. Maybe you are grateful that you were able to overcome a challenge this week. Maybe you've actually achieved something that was difficult, or maybe something got taken off your plate that you're like, oh my God, thank you. Maybe you're grateful for some beautiful moment in nature that you've experienced this week, a moment maybe of peace. This last week, I have taken time um, in the mornings to actually, when I drop my kids off at preschool, I go to um, a local coffee shop that basically I'm the only one there <laughs> about until about 10 o'clock. It is the most beautiful thing, and I'm so grateful to God for just one, finding it, and two, just 
taking the time to sit and be with God in those moments, but it has been restorative to my soul this week to just sit and have those moments. You know, a little coffee with Jesus before I start my day. So whatever yours is, you don't have to get as descriptive as I am. But I want you to write something down or text something in. Write it down. Make it cement it. Cement it. Make it permanent in a way. Maybe you just write the word hesed. And again, I don't want you to simply do it internally. I want you to make it actionable because when we join our head, our heart, and our hands, it becomes so real. Make it actionable because you have shared it. And do it now because, again, by the time you hit that parking lot, you're going to have forgotten everything. So write it down on a card, text it in. Let us reflect on the hesed of God through our gratitude today, knowing that the truth of God's loving kindness is because it is who he is. And praise Jesus, it endures forever. Amen. Amen.